My name is Ron Mahuron. I'm the Vice President for Professional Development and Research with the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. We're based in Washington, D.C. As I travel the campuses, one of my opening lines is, Hi, I'm Ron Mahuron. I'm from Washington, and I'm here to help. Yeah, that's about the kind of response I usually get. I'm very privileged to, uh, to chair this panel uh, for the next 90 minutes on economics and immigration. And before I introduce our first speaker, just a, a word about the council. So uh, those of you who are our friends, uh, alumni of, of Hillsdale College, the council is an association of Christian colleges and universities, uh, about 118 members here in North America and another 60 uh, affiliate members in 30 nations around the world. And we're uh, very pleased to be part of this program in partnership with Hillsdale and the Acton Institute to bring resources to faculty teaching in business, economics, uh, history, political science, and related fields on, uh, on the free market. This morning, our panel is entitled Economics and Immigration. We have three uh, presenters, and I'll introduce each of them uh, in the order that they will I'll speak this morning. I want to uh, note at the outset that, uh, as the title suggests, the focus of this session is on economics and immigration. Uh, no doubt during the question and answer session, uh, our, our interests may uh, run beyond the simple notions of economics and immigration, not so simple. Uh, it's a very uh, complex topic. But our speakers this morning will be focused primarily on that relationship between economics and immigration. So uh, if you have questions that you'd like to, to uh, address to the panel, we'll uh, have time at the, uh, at the last half hour of our session. Our first speaker this morning is a faculty member at uh, Hillsdale College. Dr. Kevin Porteous joined the faculty at Hillsdale as an associate professor of politics in 2008. Uh, that follows his uh, work in, in political science uh, at the University of Dallas, where he received his degree in 2006. Uh, Dr. Porteous has previously taught at Belmont Abbey College near Charlotte, North Carolina, and Mountain View College in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he is a frequent speaker at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and citizenship in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks from uh, our offices. And he uh, teaches and has research interests in American political thought and American political institutions. He writes online for The Washington Times, Human Events, and BigGovernment.com. Uh, and Kevin tells us that he is currently working on a manuscript on the framers of the Constitution. Kevin Porteous. Good morning, thank you all very much. Um, I have a confession to make after the last panel. I'm not an economist, and I'm not, even, I'm not even a mainstream political scientist. So many of your institutions, you know what the political scientists uh, look like there. Uh, it turns out I'm not one of those either, uh, which is to say I'm part of a program that has no math requirement. Uh, so, uh, so there's, there's no quantitative research going on in the Hillsdale College Politics Department. Uh, when we look at a policy or a policy issue, as I was asked to do here in the case of immigration, my first reaction, my first impulse is to say, fair enough, what are our first principles? What are we starting from? And so that's the way I'd like to approach uh, talking about immigration in the political thought and in the, the policy uh, decisions made by America's founding fathers. Uh, by the time uh, President Bush gave his address on immigration in 2006 and sort of opened up uh, the modern incarnation of this can of worms, it had become much more of an issue, uh, obviously, than he, than he thought it would become, I think, somewhat to his astonishment. Uh, and over the course of the past half dozen years, uh, America's founding fathers have proven a somewhat fruitful field for uh, those looking for support for their positions. Uh, so for example, uh, Alex uh, Nauratesh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, butchering that name and I apologize, uh, from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, commented on the first immigration law made under the Constitution in 1790 that it, quote, had zero re restrictions on immigration. 
You read that right. The first immigration law in the United States by the founders themselves supported open immigration. On the other hand, uh, Thomas Woods, who's the author of Nullification, among other books, and the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, writes that, quote, in fact, the founding fathers were by and large skeptics on immigration, citing Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, uh, Rufus King, and, and others. And the reality, I think, is that there's truth in both of those statements. And that's a hard thing to say at the, end, at the outset, right? And we have two people who take opposite positions, and there's truth in both positions. Right? Well, it's going to take a political scientist to make any sense of that, right? Uh, but no, no the, the reality is, is somewhat more complex. But at the same time, I think that once we start to unpack it, we see that, uh, that the founders had a, a, a view of immigration that's helpful to us in trying to sort out our own problems. So I said that we were going to start with first principles. And if we're going to go back to first principles, there's probably no place better to go than the American Declaration of Independence. So in that document, uh, the signers uh, argue that under the laws of nature and of nature's God, all men are created equal. And so equality under the law, equality of natural rights, equality of obligations under the law. And the political corollary of that equality principle is the principle of consent. Right? The idea that no one has an inherent right to rule somebody else, nor does anyone else have an inherent obligation to submit to the rule of anybody else. So Jefferson very famously noted that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. So political obligation for America's founding fathers was the consequence of the voluntary consent of the individuals who lived in that society. And this is a big deal. This is something I try and explain to my students. This, this was huge for them to say in 1776 because they had come out of a system, right, the English traditional system and the traditional understanding of citizenship was based on feudal obligation. And what that meant was if you were born in a particular place, you were a subject of that place's sovereign for life indissolubly. There was nothing you could rightfully do that would break that connection with your sovereign. So if you were born on British soil, you were a British citizen for life. And this view is very uh, cogently expressed by, uh, by Blackstone, who says that natural allegiance is such as is due from all men born within the king's dominions immediately upon their birth. For immediately upon their birth, they are under the king's protection. For it is a principle of universal law that a natural born subject of one prince cannot, by any act of his own, no, not by swearing allegiance to another, put off or discharge his natural allegiance to the former. And so the principle embodied, the principle of consent embodied in the Declaration stands directly opposite to that. It's the principle that Jefferson had articulated a couple of years earlier in his uh, very famous essay, A Summary View of the Rights of British America, where he says that in coming to the colonies, what are now the colonies, the original settlers exercised the right which is given to all men by nature of leaving the place of their origin and going to a place of their choosing. This is a radical rejection of the traditional English system. You are not bound to a particular place. You are not a citizen by birth. And this understanding of Jefferson's was the understanding that infused the drafting of the Constitution and American law for decades. So today we very commonly assume that the Constitution includes something that we now refer to as birthright citizenship. Now that was not, in reality, part of American law until 1898 when the Supreme Court, uh, in the case Wong, Wong Kim Ark versus United States, decided that citizenship was determined by birth. In other words, we have returned in a very significant way to the old feudal understanding of citizenship, where your citizenship is uh, uh, determined by the land in which you are born. Now, I want to be very careful right, in, in making my second point. The right to leave the place of your origin and settle someplace else is not the same thing as to say that you have a right to go to any other place of your choosing and settle there. Right? That's a different story. Right? So the right to leave a pr one place does not constitute at the same time the right to enter another place. 
Listen to what the, uh, the people of Massachusetts said in their 1780 constitution, for instance. The body politic, they write, is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. It is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good. And what they're telling us is that in order for a system to truly be consensual, in order for the principle of consent to operate and for people to be treated as true equals, consent must be mutual and reciprocal. That is to say, everyone must agree to live under the society, but the society must also agree to take in each individual who seeks to live under that society. Governor Morris declared in the Constitutional Convention that every society, from a great nation down to a club, has the right of declaring the conditions on which new members should be admitted. So consent has to work in both, uh, in both directions. Right? To say otherwise is to violate that principle of equality. So if a person can come to the United States, or any other country for that matter, and settle in that country and become a part of that political community in contravention of the laws of that country, then he is in effect declaring to that country, I am your superior, I will set the terms of the contract and impose them upon you. It would be the equivalent of my arriving at your house, declaring that I like it, handing you an unspecified sum of money and moving in. You have to agree to the contract just like I do in order for the contract to be valid and in order for uh, equality to be preserved under the consent principle. And this doctrine or this understanding in their mind uh, implied no violation of the rights uh, of the party who was denied admittance. So by refusing to allow a person to enter into the United States or again any other country, we are not denying that person of any right. He still has the right to go anywhere that will take him or to go to some unoccupied place and establish himself there and to take whatever measures he deems to be necessary and, and appropriate for the security of his rights. And so Madison had a very interesting interpretation in the Federalist Papers. What do we do about the states who don't ratify the Constitution? This was a very real problem at the time because at least two states had decided, at, the, at least temporarily, no, we don't wish to do that, Rhode Island and North Carolina. And so Madison says, well, we can't compel them. And in the absence of their free assent, we fall back on the law of nations. They're a sovereign, independent nation, and we have to treat them with the respect and, and justice that should be accorded by any nation to any other. Okay. So, so we have then um, the right to leave, but not necessarily the right to go wherever one pleases. And this takes me to my third point, which is not only does a nation have a right to place restrictions on who enters the country, who becomes a member of that political community, but under the right circumstances, there may also be an obligation to do so. Uh, this becomes apparent when we think about uh, founders' first principles in terms of uh, not just the consent of the governed, but why do we have government in the first place? And if you go back to the Declaration, the Declaration says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So not only do we have to have government by the consent of the governed, but we also have to have government that protects people's rights. So crucial to having a government that protects people's rights is having a citizenry that believes that people have rights and that supports a regime that tries to protect those rights. Uh, Washington told uh, the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, that citizenship is not a free gift of rights without responsibilities. That the United States requires, quote, that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. They have to support those principles. And a major part of that is having the kind of character that inclines them to support those principles. So in Virginia's Declaration of Rights in 1776, which was uh, authored by George Mason and served as an inspiration for Jefferson in drafting the Declaration, he says at the very end that no free government, and I'm quoting now, or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. A people which doesn't have that character will be incapable of 
asserting their rights when they're threatened, and living with others in peace. And that's a major problem for a country that seeks to protect rights. Now, this applies to immigrants as well. So Jefferson wondered right, if immigrants would be able to adopt our principles. And his point was, where are many immigrants coming from? Well, they're coming from places that don't necessarily respect rights. So if you grow up in Soviet Russia, for instance, right, the regime doesn't teach you, stand up for your rights, speak out against the government, right? see Siberia and all of its wonders. Right? That's not what you learn in Stalinist Russia. Shut up, keep your head down, do what you're told. Right? That, of course, is a problem. Right? Americans need to be vigilant in asserting their rights, but they also need to know what the proper boundaries of those rights are. Right? And most regimes don't teach that, don't imbibe that into their citizens. And so, like I said, that creates a, a major problem. So having no experience with, no, under, no real understanding of liberty, it will be difficult for immigrants to conduct themselves in a manner befitting a free citizen of a republic. They'll either continue in their previous uh, mode of servility, or being released from all controls for the first time will move in precisely the opposite direction. Now, this is interesting because at the same time that Jefferson and others expressed profound concern about the character of immigrants, they also have a very distinct sense that America should be an asylum for oppressed peoples around the world. They did not believe, excuse me, the belief that America is such a refuge did not begin with Emma Lazarus and the New Colossus the very famous poem that's on the, on the Statue of Liberty. Uh, Washington declared in the 1780s that he had always hoped that this land might become a safe and agreeable asylum to the virtuous and persecuted part of mankind, to whatever nation they might belong. And so when it came time for them to make public policy decisions, they had to try and balance those two elements in their thought, which is we need to preserve the character of the regime in order to protect the rights of our citizens, but there's also this American exceptionalism which says we want the virtuous and oppressed of the world to come here, see this as a haven for them, and to make the country better. So what did they do as a practical matter, as a policy matter? Well, initially, the Articles of Confederation said nothing about citizenship, except that states would decide the citizenship issue. And this created a number of problems because people would go to states with low citizenship requirements, and then under the Articles of Confederation, other states were bound to accept the citizenship of that person who'd come into an, an easy state to enter into. So it created some conflict. So when, it, when the, the clause in the Constitution that talks about a uniform rule of naturalization is proposed, uh, it's referred to several times, and it sails through the convention without comment or debate. The idea that we should have one rule uh, for, uh, for immigration. Right, for naturalization. Now, what, what, else is in, what, el what else is interesting in this regard is they really didn't place any restrictions on entering into the country, but they did place restrictions on citizenship, which is, of course, a key difference. When you are a citizen, you are an active member of a political community. You have a share of rule. And if we go back to Aristotle's very famous maxim of ruling and being ruled in term, you are a part of that rule. Uh, the primary requirement for citizenship was, of course, a residency requirement, which varied throughout the time period, two years, five years, 14 years, finally back to the five years uh, that we know today. So on the one hand, they didn't place any restrictions on entering into the country. On the other hand, they, they gave no substantial incentives to come to the country. You know, the basic position was expressed by uh, Benjamin Franklin. Right? Uh, with regard to encouragements for strangers from government, they are really only what are derived from good laws and liberty, unquote. So America is a place, he goes on to say, where noble birth doesn't matter, and there isn't this massive surplus of useless government jobs to be filled. It's, it's a great laugh line today, right? There's no useless government jobs out there. Well, in 1782, when he wrote that, there weren't. Right? There were very few government jobs. Right? His thought was, and the thought expressed by Washington, Jefferson, and others was, the opportunity to labor freely in a land where honest labor is honorable would be incentive enough for the type of person that we wanted, industrious and virtuous. All right. Uh, as far as the statistics, i get into the numbers a little bit, even though I don't teach any mathematics. Uh, one of the difficulties is there really aren't any. The U.S. Census Bureau did not keep track of immigration until 1820. 
So for the purposes of looking at the 1780s, 1790s, there really isn't very much to go on. However, uh, the very commonly used estimate uh, for the period, the quarter century beginning in 1790, is about 250,000. And these primarily overwhelmingly came from Northwest Europe. Right? So a few from France, but also Switzerland, uh, Germany, especially the uh, Rhine and Palatine provinces, the Netherlands, Britain, and Ireland. So where do we end up as a policy position? Right? Uh, I don't think it's fair then to say that, well, the founders supported open borders or the founders supported restrictionism. I'm not sure that those are entirely accurate uh, into and of themselves. At the same time that Jefferson worried about the character of immigrants and the character of the regime, he said, quote, if they come of themselves, they are entitled to all the, all the rights of citizenship. And again, this was a position that was reiterated frequently. The practical policy that they encouraged was one of assimilation. That is to say, becoming part of the new regime, becoming part of the order to which they had immigrated. And this was to be facilitated by dispersion of immigrants among the population. Washington, for instance, was very concerned about immigrants settling in one very collected knot in a particular place where they would retain their knowledge, habits, customs, etc., and the adoption of the English language. Now, this idea of assimilation is embodied in their 1795 immigration law, which included an oath. Right? And in that oath, an, a new citizen was required to swear in open court that he, quote, doth absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to every prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, whatever, and particularly by name, the prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty whereof he was a citizen or subject before. In other words, no dual citizenship. One sovereign, one nation, and so on. So assimilation worked then, but what about now? And I would suggest in conclusion that there are a couple of varying, there are a couple of factors at work here. Immigration was fairly low, but there were also periods of rest when those who had come to the country could assimilate. I think the other problem, the other difference with today's immigration is People in the 1780s, 90s, early 18th century were very committed to America's first principles. That is to say, you came to an environment as an immigrant that was rich with belief in ideas of liberty and equality and government by consent and justice and all of these things that are espoused in these numerous documents like the Declaration of Independence. I would suggest that that's not necessarily the case today. Right? Understatement of the century, right? Fundamentally, however, is that a problem with those who come to this country, or is it a problem with us? Right? And so in conclusion, I would say that the, the key, uh, from, from my perspective, to understanding the immigration problem today is for Americans to readopt those original principles as the best guide to their politics and policy. Thank you very much. Our second speaker this morning is Ms. Sika Dalmia, who is Senior Policy Analyst at the Reason Foundation. Dalmia is a columnist at The Daily, America's first iPad newspaper, and writes regularly for Reason Magazine. She is also a frequent contributor to the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and other publications such as the Los Angeles Times, the New York Post, the Weekly Standard, and the Chicago Tribune. She previously served as a columnist for Forbes. Damia was the co-winner of the first 2009 Bastiat Prize on, for online journalism for her columns in both Forbes and Reason. She has served as an award-winning editorial writer at the Detroit News. She worked as a reporter for The Patriot a national daily newspaper based in New Delhi, India, where she grew up and earned her BS degree in chemistry and biology from the University of Delhi. She also holds a master's degree in mass communication from Louisiana State University. So if you've been paying attention here, she's covered the map quite well. She is a frequent uh, guest on Fox Business Network and other television and radio outlets and lives in the Detroit area with her husband and son. The title of her address is The Economic Case for Open Borders. Sika Dalmia.
Thank you, Ron. Um, well, uh, 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 Kevin mentioned uh, the different character of immigrants who come to, come to the country today. Well, you know, I'm an immigrant, came here 25 years ago, and uh, came here partly for economic opportunities and partly because I love this country and what it stands for. Um, and I think uh, there are many, many immigrants who are just like me who come over here both for the opportunities and the principles that this country stands for. But we worry about every w new wave of immigrants that comes here. And this has been, as Kevin pointed out, going on since the time of uh, the independence and the declaration of independence. But uh, every wave of immigrants brings with it all kinds of concerns. I'm not here to talk about the cultural aspects of immigrants today. I'm going to focus and uh, you know, concentrate my remarks on the economics of immigration. And it's a little bit ironic that I'm talking about the economics of immigration because there are plenty of economists uh, in this room, much better qualified than me. And uh, so if you have any questions about the economics of immigration, please direct them to them after the. <laughs> um, immigration is a very, very strange issue. Uh, it's a subject of a lot of popular fear and political debate. Um, but there is a great deal of consensus among economists that immigration, in fact, is a very great blessing. What's more, this consensus not only cuts across political lines, it also cuts across methodological lines. With classical liberal, neoclassical, Chicago school, Austrian school, and even some Keynesian economists agreeing that unfettered, relatively unfettered labor mobility maximizes economic growth. Adam Smith opposed mercantilist restrictions, not just on capital, but on labor as well. Ludwig von Mises, the guru of the Austrian school, advocated a system of free trade where capital and labor would be employed wherever conditions were most favor favorable for production. There was one prominent exception to all these economists, and his name was Karl Marx. You might have heard of him. Although he didn't treat the subject in any systematic way, his passing comments here and there suggest that he was no fan of immigration. For, he, for example, he regarded England's decision to absorb the surplus Irish, Irishmen being driven out of their country during the Great Famine as a ploy by the English bourgeoisie to force down wages and lower the material and moral position of English working class. The popular modern-day restrictionist canard that immigration from the third world to rich countries is tantamount to importing poverty has its genesis in Marxist thought. Indeed, far from being embarrassed by this lineage, restrictionists actually tout it. I will quote Mr. Kerkorian himself. He said in one of his papers, employer organizations spend enormous resources lobbying the government to import a reserve army of labor, to use Marx's phrase, so that they can hold down their labor costs and avoid unionization. It is ironic that according to polls these days, half of the public of the free world, including in America, this land of immigrants, sides not with free market economists like Adam Smith and Ludwig von Mises, but Marx, the father of socialism. The primary reason for this is that the case for open borders is, in fact, quite counterintuitive. It is hard to see how, in a world of finite resources, allowing more people into the country would enhance its prosperity. Uh, it, it, you know, it's very common. I mean, it's, it seems natural to us that somehow more people, there's more overcrowding, there's more job competition, and there are lower wages. But this Malthusian worldview, I'm going to argue, is actually dangerously flawed. I will lay out the theoretical case for open borders, and I will discuss some of the empirical evidence, although you'll have to go to my full paper to see a parsing of the academic literature showing you know, why immigration is a net boon, according to economic, either eco, eco, economists. And uh, finally, I'll address the most common restrictionist objection to open borders, the issue of the welfare state. But first, let's just discuss what does one mean by open borders? For most advocates, it does not mean that anyone should be allowed into the country, no questions asked. What it does mean is that immigration should be based on the real socioeconomic needs of a country's residents, not the arbitrary whims of bureaucrats or the grand designs of social planners. 
This implies that the government has a legitimate role in keeping out foreigners who pose a genuine public health or safety threat to the people. But other than that, um, it shouldn't be up to the government to decide. Under such a system, employers and, and individuals would be able to apply to the government to bring in a foreigner. The government could accept or reject their application based on whether they pose a security threat or not, or a public health threat. But barring that, entry would be allowed. In other words, in a properly constru con constructed immigration system, there would be a presumption for liberty built into our immigration policies that would, just, that would require the government to justify to its citizens why they can't bring in some foreigner into the country, not the other way around, not the citizens who would have to justify to the government. But the best way to describe our current system the way it stands is there is effectively a ban on immigration which is then selectively relaxed based on some bureaucratic categories or some social planning ideas. So for instance, fam if family reunification these days is encouraged. Uh, ethnic diversity, which we were not in favor of for almost three decades from 1930 to 1965, is now what we want. We want ethnic diversity. And the upshot of this kind of immigration policy is that when Bill Gates, he waits years to be able to ch hire a Chinese uh, computer engineer or a California farmer who can't hire anybody on a permanent basis from Mexico, dangerous individuals are constantly s slipping in through the cracks. This is not a system that's conducive for freedom or safety or the rule of law. It virtually invites lawlessness, even as it wastes billions of dollars in border busting, uh, in budget busting border controls. So what is the theoretical case for immigration or open borders or economic case? At the heart of the economic debate about immigration stands this fundamental disagreement. Restrictionists see human beings as a liability who deplete resources. Non-restrictionists see humans as an asset who themselves are a resource. Indeed, they are the ultimate resource, as Julian Simon said. Human ingenuity and hard work turns fallow land bounteous, dirt into valuable metals, and sand into computer chips. There is no given or fixed set of natural resources out there, so Simon pointed out. Useless materials become uh, become, resource, become a resource once human creativity, creativity is uh, used to turn them such. Oil was just a toxic black liquid in the ground till humans discovered that they could burn it for energy. The development of high yield grain increased the productivity of land exponentially while human population grew only arithmetically, the exact opposite of what Malthus had predicted. The most important factor limiting a country's economic progress then isn't insufficient physical resources, but insufficient human resources. Hence, contrary to Malthusian thinking, population increases through immigration are nothing to fret over. Incidentally, there, it's not a coincidence that modern day restrictionists are also population restrictionists. James Stanton, the founder of the Federation for Emig uh, American Immigration Reform based in Michigan, um, he is uh, actually the gra grandfather of a lot of restrictionist outfits around the country. He was also a member of Zero Population Growth Club that advocates a national population policy that would limit childbirth. But immigrants are not only mouths who need to be fed, but also minds and hands who grow the economic pie. They consume resources for sure, but they produce far more than they consume over the long run. In fact, to the extent that immigrants in this country, whether they are high-skilled or low-skilled, a completely bureaucratic distinction, it's because they produce more in value or wealth for their employers than they consume. Otherwise, they would be of no value. They wouldn't have jobs. Everyone would regard it as colossally stupid if America dispatched missiles to shoot down foreign planes that were periodically airdropping free goods on American homes. Yet, why is it not equally foolish when it shoes away the source of this wealth, namely Mexicans who sweat puts cheap goods in our homes, or when it turns away Chinese computer engineers who are virtually spinning gold from sand? Restrictionists argue that ending mass immigration and creating a scarcity of labor would force industries to invest in labor-saving technologies that would drive even more productivity and growth. 
But if an artificial scarcity in labor is such a great thing, why not of other resources as well? Imagine how many more high yield grain varieties would be generated if the government told farmers that they can't farm on half of their land. The fallacy in this reasoning is that it ignores the opportunity costs. Forcing producers to search for technological substitutes for cheap immigrant labor misallocates precious time, capital, and energy that could have been deployed for all kinds of other inventions. Open trade in goods, we all agree, allows physical resources to flow where they can be deployed most productively. Likewise, open trade in labor allows human resources, even more crucial than physical resources, to flow where they can be deployed most productively and increased productivity is a win-win for all. There is plenty of empirical evidence that testifies to this. No one would dispute, I believe not even Mr. Kirkorian, that open immigration policies would be a huge economic boon for immigrants from relatively less well-off countries, the huddled masses that uh, Kevin was talking about. Indeed, a Guatemalan increases his wages sixfold for the same work simply by stepping foot on American soil. If the 30 OECD countries were to allow 3% rise in the size of their labor force, uh, the, world, uh, uh, the, the world's poor would go gain $300 billion. And that's uh, the, currently the OECD countries' entire foreign aid budget is $230 billion. Uh, immigration, in fact, is the best aid policy. Now, of course, rich countries do not have a moral obligation to fight global poverty. However, they do have a moral obligation to maximize the economic well-being of their citizens, or at least not prevent their citizens from maximizing their own economic well-being, pursuing their own happiness, as Jefferson put it. So let's just examine the benefits of immigration for Americans themselves in this land of immigrants. Economists unanimously agree that immigrants increase native earnings at least to the tune of $22 billion in two, 2003 dollars. Even Harvard University's George Porhas, the favorite economist of restrictionists, agrees that immigrants on the whole grease the wheels of the US economy because they are far more mobile than the native population, quickly moving where their skills are most needed. Now, everybody also include, it, it agrees uh, outside of restrictionist circles that high-skilled foreigners are an unmitigated economic blessing. Um, even Mr. Borjas thinks that that would be a good idea. That's because their innovations and high-tech entrepreneurship are vital in an advanced knowledge economy. They create high-paying jobs, raise native wages, and they contribute much more to public coffers than they actually consume in welfare. The real controversy is really only about the impact of low-skilled immigrants. But again, the controversy is more mostly in the political realm. Among economists, there is a great deal of consensus that even these immigrants are a net economic asset. Let me just give you a personal story that will illustrate some of the broader uh, points that are covered in the vast economic uh, or academic literature on this issue. I have a house with a rather large yard in Michigan. Some five years ago, after struggling with weeds and pests, and on the verge of really doing permanent damage to my back, I finally gave up. My husband and I, at that point, renewed our search for an affordable yard maintenance, which we had not till then been able to find, uh, because yard maintenance is just expensive in Michigan. We finally found one, one company that could, or one actually small business owner, who could provide us affordable uh, service and he was an Iraqi, we'll call him Jacob. Why could Jacob offer us a better price? Because he had somehow managed to find some low-skilled Mexicans, a very rare commodity in Michigan, by the way, to could, you know, whom he could offer cheaper wages. Over a period of time, Jacob's business has, uh, has expanded, and now he includes commercial businesses as well. Uh, he caters to commercial businesses as well as homeowners like me. So what has he had to do? His Mexican yard workers, with their very meager English-speaking skills, are unable to communicate with their business clients. So he has hired a whole cadre of native-born American Americans, barely out of high school, to accompany each of these Mexican teams on every job. 
these American kids don't have to do very much except oversee the Mexicans and talk to the client when the need arises, yet their supervisory role commands them much better wages than if they had been pulling weeds. If Jacob couldn't hire cheap Mexican labor, it wouldn't mean that he would just pay American, Americans more uh, as restrictionists sometimes claim. No, it would mean that his business just couldn't get off the ground because he wouldn't be able to offer the service at a price that would be affordable to people like me. I'd have to either give up on my nice yard or I would have to take fewer writing assignments and do yard work, which actually might pay me a little better. But <laughs> either way, there would be a net attrition in economic activity and productivity losses. So there are three broad lessons from my story, each one of which is borne out by academic literature. First, the most obvious one is that no one disputes that most Americans, like me, are not competitors, but customers of low-skilled immigrants. Immigrant presence, therefore, increases our real wages as goods and services become cheaper, allowing us to buy more income with more products with the same income. It also boosts our productivity by allowing us to use our time and uh, a time on tasks that are better suited for our natural abilities and that produce better returns for us. Second, more low-skilled immigration does not mean fewer jobs for native-born because, immigra because jobs are not a Malthusian zero-sum game. Just like Jacob's Mexican workforce, their cheaper rates expand the market for these services. In this way, immigrants create the jobs that they have, they don't snatch them from others. Their presence allows more businesses to form, creating better paying jobs for Americans as well. The only economist who has found significant displacement of natives by low-skilled immigrants in America is Borjas, and that's because he assumes far greater substitutability among them than is warranted. In reality, immigrant, immigrant inflows track labor market logic so that immigrant skills complement those of, labor, of na the native born, they don't really compete with them. Third, and the, the third lesson of this is, not only do immigrants not cost Americans jobs, they don't threat American wages either, that's the other big claim, again, that's the rap against low-skilled immigrants. That's because their presence allows natives, such as Jacob's American supervisors, to exploit their language and communication skills where their real competitive advantage lies. Now, restrictionists argue that you know, simple supply and demand economics 101 would dictate as the supply of immigrant labor increases, overall wages decrease. And Borjas has I examined this impact of diminishing wages on various native, uh, native groups by education level in this very gloomily titled paper called The Labor Demand Curve is Downward Sloping. He found that, in the, but even he found that the net overall impact on American wages as well as on every cohort of American, there was a short run downward impact. In the long run, however, the overall impact was actually zero. Could I have the slide, please? Only one group, high school dropouts, felt any, sub any noticeable and lasting negative impact, according to actually a very nifty little chart of Borjas's own findings that Brian Kaplan of George Mason University has prepared. And if you look at this chart, look at the long run wage effects uh, and the short run wage effects. And you will see that on the long run wage effects, there's only one group, college graduates, that have any noticeable long run impact. In the short run, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in the long run, that's the only negative impact. In the short run, there are more negative impacts. Um, but there is a subsequent paper by Perry and uh, Ottaviano who used Borjas's kind of data, national level data, and they couldn't actually corroborate even the short run impact on wages that Borjas found. And, uh, and as for the native, uh, the, the, the high school dropouts, they found that in the long run, there was a positive effect even on their wages, although in the short run, they found a very small 0.3% negative return. 
Now, one big reason why Borja's uh, findings, it seems, have been wrong is because he uh, made this Malthusian assumption that capital, capital wouldn't adjust much in response to the greater availability of immigrant labor. In other words, his model essentially took the existing amount of capital and divided it among the greater number of workers, and so you got lower wages. But the fact of the matter is, as employers save more, they generate more profits, more profit accumulates, more capital accumulates, and the labor capital ratio is restored very, very quickly. So in summary, open immigration policies are a win for immigrants who can escape poverty. They are a win for native consumers of immigrant services whose real wages go up, and they are a win for, uh, for, immigrant, for native workers whose productivity goes up, although there might be some pockets of losers here and there. So let me consider one powerful objection that immigration foes make to open borders that even Milton Friedman conceded was a problem, and that's namely the existence of the welfare state. You know, restrictionists, you know, people who oppose to immigration would say open borders are fine if we didn't have the welfare state. But with the welfare state, they are a problem. And essentially, because what the welfare state does is that by allowing employers to not pay uh, immigrants enough to, uh, for their needs, because immigrants can fulfill these needs in the welfare state, through the welfare state, they're essentially privatizing their profits, but they are socializing the costs on everybody else. So that's the big argument. And, uh, and if you socialize the costs of something, then you know that's not economically good. Now, unlike the economic benefits of immigration, the fiscal impact of immigration due to the welfare state is actually, it is quite contested. And there have been studies produced by CIS and FAIR and the Heritage Foundation that show that low-skilled, that uh, immigrants actually, you know, do cost the country something. But one of the problems when these studies, and I have a greater, a bigger, a longer account of this in my actual PACE paper, is that they don't do a full cross-generational accounting of the costs and benefits of immigrants. So they, caught, they, they count as costs, for instance, the cost of educating the children of immigrants, but then they don't take into consideration the taxes that these children pay after they grow up. Uh, there would be reason to worry about more open immigration policies if immigrants were actually coming to this country for welfare. That would be the kind of thing that the founders would worry about. But there is really no evidence of that. Not only is labor participation rate of foreign men much higher than, a native, than native men, but for unauthorized, unskilled laborers, it is even higher. It's, it's to the extent, it's 94%. I mean, that's really very high. And Cato Institute's uh, Dan Griswold has uh, done a study and found that actually immigrants tend to flock, low-skilled immigrants even, tend to flock to states with low social spending, not high social spending. But of course, this, you know, immigrants can go to states with low uh, social spending, but that doesn't mean that they are still not consuming more in welfare services than they are paying in taxes. So what is the fiscal impact of immigration? Now, no one disputes that high-skilled immigrants are actually, on the whole, they contribute more than they take away. The National Research Council in 1996 did the most comprehensive study that anybody has ever done. And they found that uh, high-skilled immigrants, on the whole, along with their descendants, represent 198,000 fiscal gain for the country. With low-skilled immigrants, they found that they represent a $13,000 fiscal loss, uh, they and their descendants, so that's over a period of many, many years. This figure is pretty small, but it would be even smaller now because recall that the study was conducted before the Immigration Reform Act of 1996 when immigrants, both legal and illegal, were barred from uh, most uh, means-tested federal benefits. So in other words, immigration on the whole is a fiscal plus. High-skilled immigrants are a fiscal plus. Low-skilled immigrants are a negative, but a very small negative. But now factor in the economic contributions of low-skilled immigrants, and the picture fundamentally changes. Now, also bear in mind that when we are talking these days about you know, the, the social costs of low-skilled immigrants, essentially we are talking about the cost of educating their children through public schools and for their emergency care. Now, setting aside emergency care for a little while, but Publics, any middle-income family, American family with three children, 
would be a net fiscal drag. So you can do a snapshot in time analysis of a lot of Americans and find out that there are periods in their life when they are a burden, a net burden. But that would, of course, be a very misleading picture because even, uh, because even with public schools, education is still an investment. Public schools are a very inefficient form of investment, yet they are some kind of an investment. And so the bottom line is that Ultimately, even if you subtra subtract the fiscal costs of low-skilled immigrants, on the whole, they are an Im uh, economic plus. And Texas actually has done one of the most comprehensive studies of this. The Texas Comptroller in 2006 found that illegal immigrants cost the state $504 million annually, but they actually produce economic benefits to the tune of $17.7 .7 billion. So that's the math. One final point, restrictionists talk about the fiscal cost of letting immigrants in, but rarely about the fiscal cost of keeping them out as if their own policies are costless. But the fact is that restrictionism is pricey, both in monetary terms and to our liberties. The building and maintenance cost of a 700 mile fence in the 2000 mile Mexican border not counting labor costs or the costs of acquiring land would be about $50 billion over 25 years. In addition, we would need border control agents and drones and other uh, costly paraphernalia like courts and prisons. But the biggest price of restrictionism is in lost liberties. Indeed, to keep willing foreign workers away from willing American employers requires not just barbed fences and border dogs against the immigrants, it also requires a crackdown on American employers. Some states are now requiring employers to participate in E-Verify and pay $150 to verify the immigrant, immigrant status, status of every potential recruit, whether foreigner or American, with the federal government. This is essentially a hidden tax on employment. And to make sure that business is paid, Arizona and Alabama are resorting to ever more draconian business death penalties that revoke the license of any employer who is caught twice with an illegal in their employ. So essentially, the logic is they are shutting down American businesses to protect American workers. Treating foreign workers like Malthusian mouths will put Americans on the road to serfdom. Economic growth will be just one thing that'll get trampled along the way. Our third speaker is Mr. Mark Krikorian. Mr. Krikorian has served as executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies since 1995. The center examines and critiques the impact of immigration on the United States. He frequently testifies before Congress and has published articles in numerous outlets, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and Commentary. He is a contributor at National Review Online and has appeared on 60 Minutes, Nightline, The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, CNN, and NPR. He is the author of two books, The New Case Against Immigration, both legal and illegal, and How Obama is Transforming America Through Immigration. Mr. Krikorian holds a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University. He also spent two years at uh, Yerev excuse me, Yerevan State University in the then Soviet Armenia. The title of his address is The Economic Case for Limiting Immigration. Mark Krikorian. Thank you, Ron. I forgot my Karl Marx pin uh, instead, because we're in Texas. I'm wearing my come and get it flag pin uh, from Gonzales in the Texas Revolution. Uh, you're free to read my Marxist ravings at nationalreview.com uh, or at the Center for Immigration Studies website, cis.org. That can be a resource, I think, for a lot of you who are teaching. We just released a very large compendium of immigration statistics. Um, 
uh, looking at the most recent data and, and really going into 100 pages of everything you could imagine except shoe sizes. Um, now we're considering here whether immigration, uh, whether there's an economic case for open borders in immigration. Uh, I'll be happy in the Q&A to talk about uh, the relative merits of some particular visa program or whether illegal immigrants brought here as minors should get, uh, green, uh, should get green cards, but what we're talking about here is specifically what are the economic uh, consequences of lifting controls on the settlement of foreigners in the United States. Uh, to reemphasize something Ken had said, uh, which I'll cut short in my comments here, open borders as an ideological principle, as a moral imperative, as it is presented by some of the more Jacobin libertarians, is fundamentally contrary to the very concept of self-government. If we the people do not have the authority to decide how many people, which people, on what terms are allowed to enter our country, in what sense can our political community be described as sovereign? That having been said, Unlimited immigration might nonetheless be a policy choice that the elected representatives of the people uh, might want to make. And in that light, let's look at the economic consequences of unlimited immigration. Uh, first and briefly, uh, there's no question that the first effect is that it increases the aggregate size of the economy. This is kind of obvious, but I bring it up only because many of the advocacy reports that um, state-based uh, chambers of commerce and others release about trying to get state legislators and congressmen and others to embrace the wonderfulness of unlimited immigration are based on this idea that immigration makes the economy bigger. There's no question that it does. Um, we're probably, our GDP is a one trillion dollars, maybe more, larger because of the 40 million immigrants in the United States. But a larger economy certainly doesn't necessarily mean a, uh, a better economy. Just as an example, obvious, again, this is going to be obvious to most of you, Canada and Indonesia have roughly similar size economies. No one would say that the average Indonesian is as rich or as well off as the average Canadian because there's so many more Indonesians. So then the second consideration is how much do native-born Americans benefit from immigration. In fact, that seems to me the only real yardstick for uh, assessing government policies. And there's a standard way of calculating the benefit from immigration, the immigrant surplus, which the National Academy of Sciences used, President Bush's Council on Economic Advisors uh, also estimated. And uh, to cut to the quick, the point is that there is, in fact, a net gain from immigration. Uh, something like one quarter of one percent of GDP, roughly, say, with $15 trillion GDP, $40 billion gain. Now, that comes from reducing the wages of American workers by some uh, $420 billion, but generating $460, $460 billion in benefit for those who do not compete with, America, with immigrant workers. And, in fact, uh, immigrants are a substitute for American workers. They're not the kind of workers that immigrants substitute for are the kind of workers that none of us work with or know or probably are related to. Nonetheless, there are enormous numbers of less skilled Americans and young Americans who compete directly with immigrant workers. So in a sense, um, immigration serves as a government-created vehicle for redistribution of wealth from high school dropout Americans to better educated Americans and business owners. So essentially, policymakers have, a, have to face a moral question. Is it just to reduce the wages of native-born, less skilled workers and teenagers and other uh, people who are in competition with immigrant workers in order to increase the wages of lawyers, journalists, and business owners. Guess how that turns out. Um, one final point in this respect is worth making. Uh, there's no question that immigration has significantly increased the supply of workers in occupations that require less education. 
There are obviously some highly skilled occupations that have large concentrations of immigrants as well. Nonetheless, immigration has had its largest impact on non-supervisory occupations in food service, construction, child care, agriculture, building cleaning and maintenance, and light manufacturing. Of course, there's also widespread agreement that over the past three decades, just as immigration has increased enormously, these occupations and the less educated workers who fill those occupations have seen a significant decline in the real wages and a very large decline relative to college graduates. Real wages for male high school dropouts have declined 22% since the late 1970s, and for high school, male high school graduates, real wages are down 10%. Uh, no doubt there are other factors that are contributing to that decline in wages for low-skilled workers. But such a decline is certainly what we would expect if immigration was adversely impacting blue-collar American workers. So let me come to the third uh, economic concern about unlimited immigration. It increases the size of the economy. It creates a small net benefit by driving down the wages of the poor. The third aspect is the effect of immigration on government spending. Government now spends a far larger share of national income than during prior wage, uh, waves of immigration. It's not really that the immigrants are all that different from a century ago, they're really not. But the conditions into which they come are very different. Government now spends something like 40% of GDP. Now, we all hope that's gonna go down. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, I'm knocking doors for Romney, I don't know how much good that's gonna do. Nonetheless, the basic reality of a large state spend, using taxpayer money to spend a very large share of national income is not going away. The problem is, the, the problem is was summed up by Milton Friedman. Quote, it's just obvious that you can't have immigration and a welfare state, unquote. Mass immigration, much less completely open immigration, will inevitably do be dominated by less educated, less skilled, by the poor. Importing millions of poor people with large families, as we've been doing for several decades, means that by definition they will pay relatively little in taxes and they will make heavy use of government services. This is true not because of any moral defect in the immigrants. It's not because of laziness. It's not because there's even that many people conniving abroad to come here and get on TANF. Uh, it's because times have changed. And in our modern society, 19th century style immigrant is not going to, is going to earn wages low enough to qualify for a whole variety of government services. In fact, even without open borders, under our current immigration system, which admits about 1.1 million legal immigrants each year, plus several hundred thousand illegal immigrants, uh, we have imported a poverty class that is supported by taxpayers. In 2010, immigrants and their young children accounted for one in four persons in poverty. When you look at what is called in or near poverty, which is 200% of the poverty level or less, which is the threshold for many means-tested government programs, you see that nearly half of immigrants and their young children are in or near poverty. Two-thirds of Mexican immigrants are in or near poverty, Mexican immigrants being by far the largest immigrant group, equivalent to the next 10 combined. As a result of these low incomes, immigrants pay relatively less in taxes, of course, and make relatively greater use of welfare. Among all immigrant households, in, again, in 2010, 36% receive at least one means-tested government benefit. Among immigrant households from Latin America, 50% use welfare. And among Mexican immigrants, again, by far the largest immigrant group in the country, 57% use at least one welfare program. Now, some might reply that the solution is to end welfare and shrink the state. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is usually put as the immigration C, welfare no, is how it's often put. Well, I'll make a deal with those people who believe that. Abolish welfare, abolish Medicare, abolish public education, 
totally privatize Social Security, then give me a call, and we'll talk about immigration. But even Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker understands that's not going to happen. He preferred, he, he's written that he would clearly prefer a system of totally free movement of labor, totally open borders. But, as he's written, quote, experience demonstrates that in our political system it is impossible to prevent immigrants, even those here illegally, to gain access to those benefits. I believe that with unlimited immigration, many would come mainly because they are attracted by these government benefits, and they would then be voting to influence future government spending and other pu public policies, end quote. And that brings me to my fourth point about the economics of open immigration, and that is that even high levels of immigration now under our limited system, much less open immigration, reshapes the political and social environment in ways that undermine free enterprise and economic dynamism. The leftists understand this perfectly well, and they've been quite open about the transformative effects of, of high levels of immigration. Elicio Medina, I don't know how many of you may be familiar with him, he's the vice president of the SEIU, the hard left labor union, Service Employees International Union. Uh, and by the way, is honorary chairman of the Democratic Socialists of America, so they're not even hiding it, uh, said this at a left-wing gathering. The progressive community needs to solidly be on the side of immigrants. They will solidify and expand the progressive coalition for the future. We will create a governing coalition for the long term, not just for an election cycle. He knows what he's talking about, I think. Now, there are two aspects of this transformative effect of mass immigration. The first is, as the quote um, by Medina suggests, that it imports voters. And this is what Becker pointed to as well, who will back statist, big government politicians and policies with the inevitable baleful consequences for economic growth and dynamism. Secondly, though, and more deeply and permanently, mass immigration changes American society in ways that make statist solution more attractive to voters at large, expanding the transformative effect beyond merely immigrant voters to voters who aren't even thinking about immigration. First, votes. To exaggerate only a little, the left's immigration strategy is to replace the American electorate with one that's more receptive to statism. Overall, new immigrants are voting 60 to 80 percent in favor of Democrats, not just Hispanic immigrants, but Asian, African, Middle Eastern, even European immigrants vote Democrat. Now, over time, the political preferences of immigrant groups can, in fact, change. Assimilation uh, does translate into voting behavior that's more similar to the rest of the American public. But this is a very long, multi-generational process, one that has been accelerated in the past by pauses in immigration to allow the body politic, if you will, to digest the new populations. Now, one of the reasons for this is the outsider status inherent to immigrants, just inherent to the process of immigration, which attracts them to the party of the pluribus as opposed to the unum, meaning the Democrats as opposed to the Republicans. Um, in addition, though, there are specific aspects of today's immigration that make it easy for the status left to garner the lion's share of the immigrant vote. For one thing, a large majority of immigrants are considered minorities under our current race laws and thus will benefit from race-specific policies such as affirmative action, quotas, minority set-asides. The left is the defender and promoter of such policies. Again, get rid of it, then come back and talk to me. It's a, we're, we've been expending Herculean efforts to try to limit the uh, racialization of society so far with not much effect. You simply cannot keep importing huge numbers of foreigners who the day they step off the plane or off the bus are eligible for preferences over American workers. Furthermore, America, uh, immigrants and their children disproportionately vote for the left because they are disproportionately poor, as I mentioned before. And those living in or near poverty pay very little in taxes. Now, I'm not going to make Governor Romney's mistake and talk about 47 percent voting the wrong way, but nonetheless, the small government message of lower taxes and slimmed down government simply is not going to resonate 
with people who aren't paying a lot in taxes and who also are using, making very uh, high use of government programs. They are going to inevitably and naturally be attracted to parties, to the party that wants more government programs and uh, is not interested in cutting taxes. Of course, many immigrants don't vote, either because they're not citizens or they simply choose not to, but their children are much more likely to vote. And among the children and grandchildren of immigrants, we see trends, disturbing trends, that also point to support for statist solution, statist uh, government, in addition to poverty and welfare use. For instance, shockingly, 50% of births to native-born Hispanic women, these are the daughters and granddaughters of earlier immigrants, are illegitimate. Also, the research is clear that being married is one of the key indicators of voting Republican, but only 52% of native-born Hispanics between 25 and 65, again, the children and grandchildren of immigrants largely, are married, compared to more than two-thirds of native-born whites, which itself is a, probably a low number. Uh, but again, that points to social problems that we face as a people, but that immigrants um, uh, face more seriously. Low incomes, welfare use, and family breakdown are only part of the problem. Almost all immigrants, as uh, Ken had mentioned, come from cultures that do not have a deep tradition of limited government, to put it mildly. This makes the left's approach of creating a patron-client relationship between the immigrant and the state much more attractive, more natural to them, uh, to many immigrants, in contrast to the right's approach of trying to uh, uh, of generating and fostering a self-reliant citizenry that will hold government accountable. But the electoral preferences of immigrants, of immigrant voters, are really only part of the story. Perhaps even more important is the fact that immigration creates a political, social, and economic environment more favorable to the left. Political scientist uh, Fredo Arias King, himself Mexican, by the way, uh, has written that, quote, immigration is a source of power for the etatist left, the statist left. Not so much because immigrants tend to vote for the party most associated with them, but because the consequences of immigration from poor countries fundamentally reinforces their argument for state intervention. In other words, immigration transforms American society in ways that make native-born Americans who aren't even thinking about immigration more receptive to the big government solutions of the left. Just one example of this. this is a, you see this in many policy areas. Let's just look at the issue of health insurance. Nearly one third of all uninsured people in the United States are immigrants or the young children of immigrants. And immigration is responsible for two thirds of the growth in the number of uninsured over the past decade. Would the push for increased government involvement in health care have had as much resonance with non-immigrant voters if immigration had not increased the seeming urgency of the problem. Immigration also increases income inequality significantly, both by adding to the number of low-income people through immigration and by lowering the wages of Americans at the bottom rungs of the labor market. As a result, again, calls for income redistribution and more social programs to address these problems are heard more sympathetically by native-born voters, even if they're not poor themselves and aren't even thinking about immigration as an issue. Finally, immigration increases support by, for big government by artificially increasing society's diversity. A growing body of research pioneered by Harvard's Robert Putnam of Bowling Alone fame shows that increased diversity results in a loss of civic engagement, not just between groups where different ethnic and other groups don't interact as much, but even within groups. Immigration-driven diversity means everyone in society is progressively less trusting, less involved in civic life, less likely to attend church, less likely to join the Masons, Hadassah, the PTA, less likely even to have friends over for dinner. And while this is undesirable in itself, what it means politically is that immigration contributes to the progressive weakening of what Edmund Burke called the little platoons of society, yielding more and more public space to the state thus lending increasing credence to the arguments offered by the party of more and more government.
to finish, there's the old joke about the economist stranded on a desert island with only a can of beans and no way to get to the beans. And so what he does is he assumes a can opener. Well, open borders belongs to the assume a can opener part of economics. It can be interesting and useful as a thought experiment, but its place is in the sophomore year dormitory bull session, not in serious considerations of government policy. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes for your questions. And again, please raise your hand and state your name. I wait for the microphone to come to you before uh, asking your question. And then please uh, address your question to a particular member of the panel. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Brad Bailey. I'm, uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, great panel. Um, question. Um, you know, the federal government is, is not good at picking winners and losers. Um, only market can do that, I believe. So we saw that pretty clearly with Solyndra, um, where the government chose a loser and it cost our, our economy a lot of money. Um, why then should the federal government pick out which immigrants should be allowed to come to America? Shouldn't we let the free market decide that and have minimal control of regulations? Maybe states' rights. I'm a restaurant owner here. I, I, I employ a lot of those people that you call the unskilled group. Um, I can tell you, the people that work in our two restaurants here in Houston, Texas, aren't what you just described uh, in your manifesto there, Mr. Kevorkian. Um, states, local governments understand the needs of their businesses a lot more than the federal government does. Our current system is broken, 110% broken, but it's hurting businesses because it's so broken. Let's return it to the states. The state of Texas, for example, can run a much better economy than the federal government. Thank you. If Texas returns, uh, regains its independence, that might be true. The reason states can't, cannot have their own immigration policies is because there's nothing keeping you from moving from one state to another. Tom Vilsack, uh, the Ag Secretary who was governor of Iowa, uh, a number of years ago when he was governor said, we should have an Iowa-only immigration policy. Let people move to Iowa. I mean, let more people in if they promise to move to Iowa. If people are leaving Iowa because of the weather or because of jobs or what have you, what makes you think immigrants are any different? Um, and what would stop them from just getting on a bus and going to California or to Florida uh, after once they got into Iowa? So the idea of a state-based immigration policy is just a non-starter. It cannot work in uh, an environment where people can move from state to state. Uh, as far as the, your point about picking winners and losers, I think you're right. I, much of the actually existing immigration system is absurdly bureaucratic and based on kind of ridiculous um, uh, social planning kind of concepts. You know, as the, as the government can do a labor market test accurately, collect that information, process it, and act on it in time for it to mean anything. I think all of that stuff is nonsense. Um, and now, if you want to argue, say, for some kind of um, a, some kind of system where you bid for immigrant visas or you sell immigrant visas, again, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's worth exploring. But nonetheless, we end up, you, the basic concept of the state limiting immigration is key, because if we adopt what President Bush in 2004, in January 2004, his big speech that he made on immigration. Uh, if we adopt that approach, which was, the formulation was, any willing worker can come to work for any willing employer. This is essentially the kind of open borders that Chica was talking about. Um, you have lost control of your polity. The idea that uh, this is not going to have harmful effects, the idea that this is not going to create the kind of uh, problems for taxpayers and the kind of political problems I referred to is a fantasy. And the only uh, way supporters of that kind of approach escape that, pro escape that reality is to say, well, we'll let them in, but we won't let them be citizens. They'll only be temporary workers, and they'll leave when they're done. Sorry, but 
All of human history shows that there's nothing as permanent as a temporary worker. The very illegal immigration crisis we are facing today is the result of the Bracero program, which was a temporary worker program from the 40s to the 60s that created the networks, the momentum that we're still experiencing from illegal, from, with illegal immigration. So, um, I mean, I am completely sympathetic with the idea that we have a very badly constructed immigration system. And in fact, I lay out in a little more detail the way I think it ought to be reformed it's in the final chapter of my book on Amazon. Um, I think it's, uh, it's in the digital remainder bin at Amazon, I'm afraid, so you can pick it up cheap. Um, but, but, I mean, I agree with you that the system is poorly put together. The answer is not to simply let in anybody that anybody wants to hire. Um, if I can just jump in over here. Uh, Mr. Kukorian is actually being too coy over here. He does have a solution to the kinds of bureaucratic hassles that you're talking about that immigrants encounter. His solution is to actually just stop all immigration. I mean, he's pretty explicit about that. He wants no high-skilled and he wants no low-skilled immigration. He wants a moratorium on immigration. Uh, and what that'll do to businesses like you and what it'll do to the economy, one can only, you know, fantasize about that in, I suppose, sophomoric dorms. It's not something that should be admitted, I suppose, in adult company, but you face that uh, day in and day out. As for the Barcero program that Mr. Krikorian was talking about, actually, if anything proves that temporary uh, uh, generous guest worker program would work beautifully in this country, it's actually the Barcero program. The entire problem of illegal immigration was created after that program ended, and the the reason was, at that time with the Barcero program, there was essentially a very easy way for employers like you to get visas for you know, Mexican, Mexican workers, and they could come and go with the seasons. So American farm, farm jobs during summer in California, you would have a huge influx of the Mexican population that would go back to their country at the end of the, at the, end of the season because they could get a visa to re-enter the country when they wanted to. Essentially, by eliminating that guest worker program, it, it, uh, we made it very risky and costly for these cross-border flows to happen with the result that the people who come here now stay here because if they were to go back, they would have to pay smugglers' fees, they would have to risk crossing a huge desert, you know, possibly dying in the process, so they just stay over here. So, it, you know, there's a very cute line, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary work, uh, worker visa, but that's because of the way our laws are constructed that restrict mobility. We've had a very, very successful program with the Barcero program, by the way, which ended because of union opposition. Unions were opposed to the competition that cheap Mexican labor presented. That was the problem, that's why it ended. So if, uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if I could respond, first of all, I've never used ever the word moratorium. Um, I, like I'll, I'll give you the very brief version of the last chapter of my book, which you can read in more detail when you buy it. Um, my point is, and the, the basic point of my uh, policy prescriptions is that a modern society doesn't need any immigration. But that doesn't mean zero immigration. That means zero-based budgeting in immigration. We start at zero and then decide which specific categories of immigration are, have, are so compelling that we admit them regardless of the problems high-scale immigration can cause. Uh, and that would be, number one, spouses and little children of US citizens. That's 350 to 400,000 people a year, right off the bat. Secondly a handful of genuine Einsteins, the best and brightest that we have categories for now, but even they are bureaucratic, and then we admit lots of people who don't fit that bill. I actually have recommended in the book, half, tongue half in cheek, that we just give people a IQ test in English, and if you get 140, uh, we let you in, and if you don't, you don't. Um, because tying workers to jobs, as this willing worker, willing employer model would have it, is just a recipe for indentured servitude. And then thirdly, some modest number of uh, genuine refugees who will never have anywhere else to go. Uh, that adds up to, you know, if we're talking 400, maybe 500,000 people a year, half of what we take now. That's not no immigration, but it's much less immigration. And let me one comment on the Bracero program. Uh, 
there's this idea that, there's the, that we now have a ratchet effect because people can't just come and go from Mexico freely, that they're coming and staying. Uh, the data shows, in fact, that the percentage of people from Mexico coming to the United States and then going back has been going down. It's been declining. There's no question about that. But it's been declining since they started collecting data. It has nothing to do with enforcement. It has to do with the movement of rural people in Mexico into urban areas. It's something that's happened in every country in the world as it's developed. It's just that because of our cockamamie immigration policies, a very large share of Mexico's rural population is moving to our cities permanently instead of moving to Mexico's own cities permanently. We're going to move to our next question. Sorry. Yes. Uh, George Selgin, University of Georgia. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I wanted to say to Mr. Uh, Krikorian, I'm glad to know that you don't think the government is good at picking winners and losers. I wish you weren't so confident in your own ability to do so. Uh, my question is, my question is, uh, has to do with your remarks concerning how uh, immigration has tended to depress wages in the blue collar industries, but it seems to me that many of those industries are precisely the ones that are in danger of failing as a result of foreign competition or that have been surviving by means of outsourcing or simply leaving to relocate in foreign countries, allowing for those alternatives rather than just the possibility that keeping immigrants out will raise the, keep the wage rates of existing workers high, is it really possible confidently to declare that holding immigration down will ultimately make workers, existing U.S. workers, better off? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> and the reason is that a very large share of the occupations of the jobs that we are importing immigrants to do cannot be traded. You can't import housing from China. You can't import restaurants from Bangladesh. You can't import office cleaning from Nigeria. Now, there are some things you can import. Uh, and I'm actually, I like trade, but I'd much, much rather import the product of the labor of a Mexican worker than importing the Mexican worker himself. Because importing a worker changes your society fundamentally because he is now, because he's a human being. He is not simply a labor input. Workers are not just labor inputs, whereas the product, the congealed product of their labor in a shirt that we import or a pair of shoes or what have you, uh, is an inanimate thing that we can dispense with and doesn't change our society in any way. There is a fundamental moral difference between importing the foreign worker and importing the product made by that foreign worker, and I'm actually happy to import the product made by the foreign worker. I don't want to import the worker himself. We have time for one final question. Hi, Jameson Taylor. I want to um, thank both of you, in particular, Sika and Mark, for the work that you do, and I respect the work that you all do. I have an economics question, but I want to preface it by just wondering whether or not we can even answer this question fully by just talking about economics, in spite of the fact that that's the theme of the talk. And Kevin, I think, kind of touched on that. You touched on some of that as well, Mark, in talking about some of the costs of immigration that we don't usually uh, think about when we think about immigration. Um, my economics question is, though, it seems like you guys are using some very different numbers to get at the economic costs of immigration. And I think that's the case because it's extremely difficult to actually quantify the costs. The costs are very, very broad. Just as, just as people are a great resource, people also bring about lots of different problems that we can't fully anticipate. Um, so I'm wondering if we can just look at one study, for instance, the report that the Texas Comptroller did. Would you guys be comfortable commenting on the pros and cons of that study. Mark, for instance, why you think it's deficient. Sika, why you think that it's a methodologically sound study. 
Um, I mean, I'd have, for myself, no. I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me, so no, I couldn't do that. Yeah, it would be hard for me to do it from memory, too. I think the National Research Council study, the 1996 study, which looked just at the, you know, the welfare costs, um, the fiscal costs of immigrants, that's a better study that both sides actually refer to. And, uh, you know, you can look at, I mean, that, you know, that I think that's... Uh, What's not that hard is to assess the costs of immigrants. What is much hard, harder is to assess the benefits of immigrants because they are so intangible. Uh, so by and large, my impression is that the benefits of immigrants are, are largely undercounted or they are underestimated, whereas there is a tendency to exaggerate their costs. And the Texas Comptroller study actually did a very good job of trying to balance both sides out. Uh, in the National Research Council study, what they did very well was that they uh, looked at the cross-generational costs of immigrants. So they looked at not just the, you know, the, the investment, public investment in, the, in immigrants at any moment, but then what the returns of those investments were uh, when their children started paying off. Now, the Mark Korean side basically stops at the analysis that the NRC did in terms of the costs that the first generation immigrants use, and then doesn't look at the rest of it. But actually, if you look at that entire study, I think that's a pretty good benchmark to think about this whole issue of the cost of immigration. Uh, the, re uh, the reason I actually don't think uh, that the parts of the National Research Council study of costs that project into the future are kind of dubious is, first of all, they're projecting 300 years into the future to figure out the costs and benefits. We're talking, you know, the taxes paid by Captain Kirk, um, literally. Uh, and also, it's, they make all kinds of assumptions about when the, balance, the budget will be balanced and there'll be a deal in a particular year in 2020 something or other made by Congress. I mean, a lot of it is kind of fanciful. I would just leave you with this thought. If low-skilled immigrant workers are so great for the economy, why are we spending so much effort in educating our own workers? The National Education Association can do a great job of turning out high school dropouts. Why import more of them? Well, can I, can I respond to that? <laughs> let, actually, let me respond to that, which is that, you know, Protectionism doesn't work when it uh, is applied in trade, and protectionism doesn't work when it uh, is applied to labor. I come from Detroit, where American uh, automakers, uh, you know, at a at a time they were uh, they were asked uh, th uh, there were great deal of protectionism against Japanese car makers. They had to uh, Japanese car makers like Toyota and Honda had to agree to voluntarily sell fewer cars in America because our American companies couldn't compete. What was the upshot, uh, upshot of that, the upshot of that was that our co companies became globally less competitive. We just couldn't make products that were good enough to sell abroad. The same thing happens when you protect labor. One of the upshots of letting uh, low-skilled workers from Mexico into the country is that has induced our, uh, Ameri our native-born American children to acquire the skills to move on to the higher rungs of the job ladder. So with the result, there is a greater incentive for them to actually finish school because they can't simply count on that plumbing job or that weed pulling job. And if you look at the statistics, and I would point you to a very, very good paper that Dan Griswold of Cato Institute did, which was uh, basically made the case as Mexican workers have moved into the so-called underclass in America, the um, um, American workers have actually moved into the middle class, and there is a very, very big correlation. Just to give you one statistic from there, between 1995 and 2004, the number of families living under the official poverty level fell from 8.1 8 8 million to 7.6 million in America. Immigrant household poverty rose by 194,000. But the native households that were in poverty decreased by 675,000. So that's what immigrants are doing. Well, they I are basically doing low skill jobs and allowing Americans to move to the middle class. Okay. There's one thing that's very clear. Two things. One is the debate will continue, although number two, you never want to be the person that stands between a big audience and lunch, and that happens to be us. Please join me in thanking our panel.